Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, a slightly different type of video. Uh, I'm going to be discussing watches I really don't like. My five watches I, I dislike the most. Um, and guys, you know me, I, I try to be as positive or, or as positive po as possible, and that's just the way I approach life. Uh, if you've watched my, and I, I do urge you to check this video out, my 10 ways to be a better watch collector, one of, one of my kind of fundamental rules. And actually, it doesn't apply just uh, to watches. I think it's um, important to have a, a rich, fulfilling, happier life. Is always to um, kind of approach things with, with the attitude of, if you haven't got anything good to say, it's best not to say anything at all. And no matter how difficult it is, um, I, I slip up as well, but if you, you know the important thing is always to try and you just have better relationships with people you have a better existence it's, it's common decency it's it's just common sense as well at the end of the day so have a look back at the video it's it's I think um, that video really does uh, encapsulate what the channel is all about or, or what I'd like it to be about at the end of the day um, so <laughs> Yeah, why am I talking about this? Well, actually, it is one of the most frequently asked questions. Uh, people always ask, TGV, TGV, what watches do you not like the most? Um, and it was pretty easy to come up with this list. So I selected five watches, and I think if when we analyze it, it kind of highlights some really interesting points that I want to discuss with you. Um, so yeah, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Uh, I'll do a quick wristwatch check before I completely forget, but yeah, as, as I'm wearing blue, I, I strapped on the old Squally 1521. The Azura always brings a smile to my face. Super fun, Swiss-made dive watch with that retro feel. Anyway, yeah, let's, uh, as, as this watch implies, let's dive in. Okay, number five is a watch I actually really, really love. But in a moment, you'll see why it's also a watch I profoundly dislike. So this is the Royal Oak Double Balance Wheel Open Work. This is a really fascinating take on the Royal Oak. I think it was released in about 2016, if I recall correctly. There's the standard open work, which is gorgeous in itself. But this has the double balance wheel. Let me just explain a little bit because it's relevant to, to why I also dislike it a lot. So this is the caliber 3132, which is super, super thin. So by having two balance wheels, this creates an oscillator with more mass and, and therefore ensuring greater stability. This is why, for example, in you know the older uh, marine chronometers, you always saw a really, really big oscillator. And as you can see, I'll, I'll insert some shots. They are set against each other to self-regulate, which is just insanely cool. And theoretically, in having the double balance springs when in the vertical position cancels each other's rate of error. Essentially the case and everything, the dimensions, it's like your standard Royal Oak, right? But the, the, the skeletonization allows you to really enjoy that movement. There's an incredible amount of decoration. And you've got to remember that most of the finishing is done by hand. If you look at the bridges, the beveling, because of these uh, very um, specific shapes, it's all done by hand. And if you recall in, I think uh, it was my visit to the Roman Gauthier factory when I went to Switzerland, if you, if you remember in that uh, video, I, I showed the process of just you know, all the different steps. It's not just one abrasive little bit of bamboo. There's, all, there's different um, stages to finally get that high polish beveling. I mean, it, the, the, the attention to detail here is incredible. A lot of innovation in the movement. There's a lot of Port horology decoration going on. This is what AP do do best. I mean, I, I adore AP, I respect their independence, their heritage, amazing brand. So why do I dislike this watch? Well, it's not actually the watch I dislike. It's the aftermarket blinged out versions. And what happens is diamonds are added to that wonderful integrated bracelet. Okay, at the end of the day, this is just personal taste, but 
What I really enjoy about the Royal Oak, uh, especially the bracelet version, is the different finishing on the bracelet and, and seeing that contrast. You can't enjoy it when it's encrusted with diamonds. The diamonds also have the effect of diminishing the impact of the skeletonization. They draw attention away from the dial. What I liked about the, the, the open work watches from AP or the, the Royal Oak open, watch, uh, open Works is that contrast between the busyness of enjoying that movement and then the rather I wouldn't say industrial, but that kind of modernist, very clean, straight-edged case and bracelet. And it draws the eye's attention to the dial. And it's mesmerizing. If you've ever seen one of these in the flesh, uh, I mean, there's, there's various generations of the open work. The more recent have got more innovative with the addition of the, uh, the double balance wheel. Even the, the, the early ones, it was a beautiful thing to behold. And that golden balance bridge in particular is just, ah, oh, it's, 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 you know, that's what, that's the bling, you know. It's, it's kind of horology bling, if that makes sense. You even get to see the, the barrel spring. The diamonds undermine all of that. And I feel they cheapen a, a watch, a, a whole horology icon. In my opinion, if you like blinged out watches, if they suit your style, then that's absolutely fine. Different strokes for different folks, all those cliches. At the end of the day, you know, if we all had the same taste, if we all liked the same things, it would be really, really boring. That's frankly awful. Okay, moving on. Number four. Well, this is very, very easy. I've mentioned this before. And it's the movement chronographs. If you recall my videos talking about movement, I looked at the, the good side and I looked at the not so, not so good side. Um, what I really dislike about this watch is the fact that the chronograph is essentially useless. They've tried to do away with any markings on the dial in attempt to make it more minimalist and more stylish, but it completely negating any function. I think good design is always a balance of form and function. I mean, if, if we've looked at the Bauhaus as a, as a prime example, where it's, you know, done to a mathematical level, you know, if we look at Max Bill, for example. Why I dislike this is that, well, first of all, it's, it's completely useless. You, you, you can't use it. I love chronographs, as you know. Um, they're a wonderful complication, uh, a historic complication. I mean, those pushers might as well be just, you know, stuck on. It, 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 there's no actual use of them. I have no issue with it being quartz. That's not my issue. I just think that with a lot of these fashion watches, and if you've seen my videos talking about them, is, is really the, the exorbitant prices uh, that they charge and also the fact that what you could have bought with that money. You know, it's, it's just about raising awareness. But like I also said in those videos, it did get a lot of people into watches. Any watch that gets anybody interested in this hobby is worth respect. Okay, number three is a Patek Philippe. The Patek Nautilus 59761G. Now this was released to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the Patek Nautilus. Uh, that hugely, also another hugely iconic Genta design. Looking at it, I, I actually like it. Now, you guys know I'm not, I'm not a massive fan of the Nautilus, I have to be honest. It's a, it's a watch that a lot of people adore. It's a grail watch for a lot of people. I've handled, I've worn, I have friends that, that own them. They just don't do it to, for me. I'm not gonna pretend to like a watch just because everybody else does. However, I don't actually mind the chronograph. I, I love the sub-dial at the six with the two hands there. It's nice, and I love that blue of, of the dial. So this is a beautiful autumn automatic flyback chronograph movement with a column wheel, vertical clutch, and plus it has the date. They made it 49 millimeters. Yes, yes. 49 millimeters. Why, I have no idea. Um, I think it just completely undermines any kind of elegance that the Nautilus had. Those kind of sizes are sizes you see of like those really big Invictors. It's not something that you <laughs> associate with such a historic, super high-end luxury sports watch, right? 
49 millimeters. <laughs> Okay, for such a, a special occasion, okay, the, the, the regular version, fine, but with the chronograph, I, I felt it was a missed opportunity to do something a little bit more special. If we look back at AP, when the, uh, because obviously the Royal Oak predates the Nautilus, in 2012, when they had their 40th anniversary, we saw a, a skeleton dial, and it was, it, I think it was in platinum. It, it wasn't that loud. It was, it was a great way to, to mark the occasion. Uh, last year, in 2017, we saw the 40th anniversary of the first ladies AP Royal Oak and they did the, the frosting gold and, the, and I think frosting uh, on white gold as well, which, okay, was quite divisive. I really loved it. I thought it was a great way of adding a little bit of pizzazz and bling without actually adding the bling. If you've ever seen one in, in the flesh, the way they play with the light, it's quite mesmerizing. So I really like what AP did. I don't know what happened with Patek. You know, I just don't know what happened with Patek. Why? Okay, the date stamping on the dial, I can kind of forgive it. The baguettes uh, for the hour markers, okay, it's not as flashy as having, you know, diamond encrusted bezel, which I, I think would have been a huge mistake. But it's, it's, all, it's quite a subtle way of blinging out the watch. Um, but the size, I mean, oh. The funny thing is, um, the thing I, I like the most uh, with these commemorative uh, special editions was um, the cork box returned, which is how they used to sell the originals in these kind of boxes made out of cork. It's not a good thing when the best thing about it is <laughs> the box it came in. <laughs> okay, number two and yep. It's a Rolex. It is, brace yourselves, this is the Rolex Leopard Dial Daytona Cosmograph. Perhaps, uh, well, not perhaps, I think this is the most outrageous Rolex ever made. And none of it, this is the <laughs> really surprising part, none of it is aftermarket. It was entirely made by Rolex. So it has 48 factory set diamonds and it's made out of 18 karat yellow gold, 36 cognac colored sapphires on the bezel with a strap matching <laughs> in leopard print matching the actual watch. I, I can't even begin to, to describe how loud and obnoxious, garish and just flamboyant this 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 watch is. Even Liberace would probably say that's a bit much. <laughs> so this was released in 2005. Why you'd you'd release such a, a, a monstrosity, uh, and maybe that's a bit harsh, but guys, if you like it, you know, who, who am I to judge, you know? Um, I have actually seen one of these in, in, in person uh, in Las Vegas, which is probably the, the, <laughs> the only, place you could get away with wearing such a thing. The irony is that it's quite rare now and just like all Rolexes, the, the price is astronomical. Underneath you have the Calibre 4130 automatic, which you'd find in the other Daytonas of that time. I think why I dislike this watch so much, and I, to be honest, it's not that I dislike the watch, it, I dislike what it represents and that is the negative side of Rolex. I'm a big, big Rolex fan. You guys know that. I adore Rolex. Uh, nobody can deny their impact to the history of horology, their innovations, their, their list of firsts is never ending. Their technology that they constantly push, the quality, the, the fact that they retain value. They're such an aspirational, powerful, powerful brand. However, there's this side of uh, Rolex, the, you know, it makes me think of, well, to be honest, it, it, it's kind of pimpalicious. Uh, so far away from my humble little uh, unassuming explorer, right? Oh, and I forgot, it has diamonds on the dial, but you, it's, it's so loud, you hardly even notice it, you know? The only thing good about this watch is perhaps that, uh, if you remember, I did a, a video talking about Rolex, they have their own gemologists uh, in the factory, so, the standard of quality in the stones is of the highest order. And it's, of course, it's gonna be a beautifully made timepiece and it's gonna keep its value just like any other Rolex. Um, 
My God. My God. Can you imagine me wearing this? Can you, can you imagine me wearing this? Okay, so what's that number one? What could I possibly dislike more <laughs> than, than the Leopard uh, Daytona? Well, again, I hope you're sitting down. This is the Tourette. I hope I'm pronouncing that. Um, not Tourette, but Tyrette. So a New York-based watchmaker, and this is a special edition they did for Kanye West. Actually, I've got to say, he, he is a very, very talented producer, um, a, a very, a very uh, humble man, shall we say, and uh, always, always uh, so um, classy in his demeanor and um, how he treats other people. So this is a, a, a special edition, it reportedly cost $180,000 and took over five months to craft, according to this article in Time magazine. Now, Tyrette or Tourette's or whatever they're called, um, I tried to look them up. There's not that much about them online. Uh, they specialize in very expensive, blinged out watches for celebrities mostly. I couldn't find any specifications about this particular watch um, other than this article in Time magazine. Apparently the dial is mother of pearl and it has Kanye West's uh, very lovable face on the dial, <laughs> encrusted in diamonds and a diamond set bezel uh, with, and I quote, very large diamonds. <laughs> I couldn't find anything about the movement, uh, but looking at their website, most of the movements they use are, yes, ETAs, modified ETAs. Yeah, spending a hundred and odd thousand dollars on an ETA based um, luxury watch. It's, it's completely impractical. You can't even read the time on it. The date is pretty visible. So at least you know the date. <laughs> right. Yeah, I, that's got to be my number one, guys. If, if, and if, guys, if you know anything about this particular brand, please do share in the comments. I'm trying to think of the what positive I could say about this watch, and there is absolutely nothing um, positive to say about, <laughs> about this watch. I, so therefore, it's at my number one. Yeah, so stay tuned. There's going to be a special edition solid yellow gold one, uh, 1521 with my face on it encrusted in diamonds. And uh, it will have... Uh, <laughs> it will have... Uh, <laughs> okay, guys, I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to leave it there. Let me know which watches you dislike the most and please try to stick to watches that, that you have at least seen in the flesh. I can proudly say that I have seen most of these watches with the exception of the Kanye one in the flesh. Um, bit of a different spin today, but fun all the same. Uh, let me know your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it and found it useful. And as always, you'll catch me with a more positive video, like normal, in the next one. Okay guys, ciao.